I'd like to have you know a little bit about our guest this morning, the one person that all of us wanted to be here to begin our day in May. She was born in Indianapolis and received a Bachelor of Science degree from Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri, and holds a Master's degree in Religious Education from the Pittsburgh Seminary in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She has traveled extensively in Europe and in the Middle East, has conducted leadership training classes for the Co Commission on Ecumenical Missions and Relations in India, Pakistan, Thailand, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. She has been a director of the Bureau of Work Programs for the Department of Labor and has done volunteer work with disadvantaged youth in Indianapolis, Chicago, and Minneapolis. She has served on the Governor's Human Rights Commission. She's on the Board of Directors of Volunteers Unlimited and is a member of the Urban Coalition, as well as, a, as of the Minnesota Council for Civil and Human Rights. She presently serves with distinction as the Director of the Minneapolis Department of Civil Rights, and I'm very happy to present to this audience, to the Augsburg community, to begin our one day in May in order that we might indeed be sensitized to the problems which confront us, Miss Lillian B. Anthony. Miss Anthony. I'm particularly very pleased that you can still give me such a warm welcome after I have kind of goofed up your program. <laughs> but uh, I really uh, kind of goofed it up because I got up this morning at 6.30, uh, <laughs> uh, going to be on time. You know, we black people have something called CP time, and they, that's called colored people's time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm trying to get rid of all those stereotypes, you understand? And, um, <laughs> So I would not have been here uh, late had I not really read, I thought, that I was supposed to be here at 9.15. And so I would like to start right away, and I hope that I can have my extra 15 minutes, because now as I'm speaking to audiences around the country, I am convinced that talking is of little value. You know, everybody has said everything, every book has been written in terms of racism, race relations, civil rights, and human rights. That is nothing new under the sun. <laughs> but I think I have something new to tell you. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, I would like to make it very clear that I speak uh, from many points of view today. I speak certainly as the director of the Civil Rights Department, but I also speak as a black woman. I also speak as an Afro-American. And I'm sure there's some of you who will then get in that bag and say, well, we don't understand what black people want to be called. Some say black, some say Afro-American, some say colored, <laughs> some say Negro. You know, what do you really want to be called? Well, you know, that's one of those changes you're going to have to go through with us because we haven't decided yet. <laughs> <laughs> Ozzie Davis said very recently in Washington, D.C., in a conference on the treatment of minorities in the textbooks, Ozzie Davis said we fought for 100 years to get them to spell in with a capital N, and now we want them to stop using Negro altogether. And I'm very serious about this one, and I would like to, to start off by reading uh, a poem by a young 17-year-old Afro-American young, young woman. It's called Black, I Am a Negro and I Am Ashamed. Chemicals in my hair to make it other than what it is. Bleaches on my skin to make it more non-black. Cosmetics on my face to be like the other. Why must I try to be other than what I am? The French say that they are French from France. The Irish say they are Irish from Ireland. The Italians say they are Italians from Italy. And I say I am a Negro from where? Is there a Negro land? The French, the Irish, the Italians all have a culture and a heritage. What is my land? Where are my people, my culture, and my heritage? I am a Negro, and I am ashamed. Who gave me this name? Slaves and dogs are named by their masters. The free men name themselves. Must I be other than what I am? I am black. This is a source of pride. My hair is short and finely curled. My skin is deep hued from brown to black. My eyes are large and open to the world. My lips are thick, giving resonance to my words. My nose is broad to breathe freely the air. My heritage is my experience in America, although not of it. Free from pretense, open to truth, 
seeking freedom that all life may be free. I am black, America has cause to be proud. I would like to read one more. This one has been written by an Indian recently. All the war since the Indians fell, I think the country is going to hell. They talk of giving it back to us. If they do, we'll raise a fuss. Politics, wars, racial rights. Sorry, white brother, we wouldn't buy it. <laughs> pretty terrible indictment on the condition in the United States of America. But I have found that this condition is not peculiar to the United States of America. I found wherever there were colored people or black peoples in the world that this condition then was the usual. I found after working in Egypt for three years that an Egyptian could have a child and if that child was ugly in terms of the physical features, that that child was called beautiful if it had fair and light skin. It could be very beautiful in terms of physical features, and if it was black, then it was ugly. I found the same thing was true in Japan, where they like to be called those who are fairer in complexion were the ones who were called beautiful. I found the same thing in China, which was Hong Kong. And so I'm convinced that there is something wrong with our psyche in the United States of America and there is something that's perpetuating us to look at one another in terms of color. So I have designed a little piece. And this piece is called Take a Look in the Mirror. How many of you know Aretha Franklin? Yeah. <laughs> well, Aretha Franklin has a record called Take a Look in the Mirror. And it says, take a look at yourself, but don't look too close, because you just might see the person that you hate the most. Lord, what's happening to this human race? I can't even see one friendly face. Brothers fight brothers and sisters wink their eyes while silver tongues bear fruits of poison lies. Take a look at your children, born innocent every day, every boy and every girl denying themselves a real chance to build a better world. Dear Lord, dear Lord, what's happening to your precious dream? It's washing away on a bloody, bloody stream. Take a look at your children before it's too late and tell them nobody wins when the price is hate. And I think throughout the history of the United States where the black man and the Indian and other minorities have come into this country, we have all been taught that we must get rid of blackness. And all of us who were then black and had some pigmentation, regardless of the degree, were taught that all you white folks <laughs> were nice and good. <laughs> and I would like to say this to you, racism is something which is very real. And many people have said, I'm not a racist. I've never discriminated. I've never segregated. Don't put me in that bag, you know. No, I want to hear about all those things that happened years and years ago. I wasn't even here. <laughs> I'm sure that's what you'd say. You know, I don't even know that some of my ancestors had anything to do with this mess, all right? This color here for you way back there in the back, this is yellow. And this color here is, is really more pink, but it's supposed to be red. The next color is black. The next color is white. Now, those of you who are up here real close, did you notice something that began to happen? There are some words written on each of these colors. Yeah, yeah, all right, just kind of, some of you got that 2020 vision can even see. There's some words on each one of these pages. Notice the space that those words take up on those pages. All right, now let me read to you what these words say. These words are from the 1967 Webster's Dictionary. And young, bright college students, I know that you're gonna check me out, so you just go right on. And let me read to you what it says here. <clears throat> Having a yellow-like pigmentation of the skin is that characteristic of Mongolians or Asians. Jealous or melancholic, cowardly or untrustworthy, cheaply sensational to, s sensational to an offensive degree set of certain newspapers any of several fungus or virus diseases of plants causing yellowing on the leaves, stunting of growth, jaundice especially for farm animals, bad humor, jealousy to make or to become yellow, red. Now, I'm not reading all of it, but just the parts that are really important for us. North American Indian, a red object, a red space in various chess games, having or being of the col color red or any of its hues, having red hair, 
having are considered to have a reddish or coppery skin as the North American Indian, politically radical, revolutionary, especially communists of the Soviet Union, in the red, losing money as a business, in debt. Paint the town red to have a noisy good time as by visiting bars, nightclubs, see red to become or be angry. Black, opposite of white. <laughs> Dark complexion, Negro, totally without light, soft, dirty, wearing black clothing, evil, wicked, harmful, disgraceful, sad, dismal, gloomy, sullen. Oh, you can see why we never want to be called black. <laughs> Dark clothing as for mourning, black villain. Now, white, having the color of pure snow or milk. <laughs> Couldn't be plain old snow or milk. Gotta be pure snow or milk. <laughs> Unbelievable, wait, you're gonna get sick. <clears throat> Free from evil intent, harmless as white magic, a white lie. Happy, fortunate, auspicious, set of times and season. Having light colored skin, Caucasian, of our control by the white race as white supremacy. Right after this, listen to the next thing. Honest, honorable, fair, dependable. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Purity, innocence, white or light colored specific, specifically, the auburn of an egg, something white, nearly white in color. Goes on white wine, white pigment. Goes on, white bread, fine flour. A person with a light colored skin, member of the Caucasian division of mankind. Uh, did it say that the Negroes weren't division of mankind? Did it say the North American Indian was a division of mankind? Did it say that, that yellow one was a division of mankind? It's a kind of insidious, subtle kind of teaching of racism. Now children first learn color. Then children learn how to spell those words, and then if it's a good teacher, you know she's trying to involve the class, and so she sends them to the dictionary to look it up. <laughs> then she goes into those little things like, you know, we want you to, to share with the class. And so now here we have an Asian in the class, and we have a black person in the class, and we have an Indian in the class, and we have Caucasians in the class, because, you know, and then it says, share your, you know, the definition of you. What do you think would happen? Well, am I going to get up and <laughs> tell all these things here? Am I going to feel proud about it? Am I going to feel good about it? And so now we got a job to do with the dictionaries and the encyclopedias. Just in the basis of color. For instance, people have said to me time and time again, why do you have this hang up on color? I said, because it's your hang up. You know, because I have been taught this all my life to hate what I am. In my family, the worst profane word you could say was black. We never heard any profanity anyway. If you slammed the door, mama had a fin. But you call somebody black somebody or described him as black somebody, that was the most profane thing you could say <laughs> to the point that daddy would come home and daddy was mad at somebody. He said he was the color of that stovepipe. <laughs> I wasn't going to call him black. So this is the kind of hang up we have, or secondly, I will make a presentation and after I get through with a white audience, somebody invariably, invariably says, but Lillian or Miss Anthony, you are different. That's one insult. <laughs> the worst one comes when it says, but I didn't even see your color. I didn't see you as a Negro, and that's really bad news. Because what are they saying to me when they say that? They saw me only in their image, only in their image. And this is what Kenneth Clark did with these young children, four years old when he first got them, gave them all dolls, black dolls and white dolls, and says, you know, pick any doll you want. All black children, every one of them picked a white doll. A year later, Kenneth Clark took that same group, group of children, and he said, who are you? And they grinned and they beamed and he said, are you colored? And they said, no. Are you Negro? No. Are you a nigger? No. What are you, black and beautiful? And they picked black dolls. What we're trying to say is that the whole business of, of racism is very complex. And Kenneth Clark says something else, and I would like to read it verbatim from his book on the dark ghetto. I don't know how many of you might have read it. I'm reading from the introduction now to the epilogue. And he says here, 
For many years before I became an involved observer, Harlem, Harlem had been my home. My family moved from house to house and from neighborhood to neighborhood within the walls of the ghetto in a desperate attempt to escape its creeping blight. In a real sense, therefore, dark ghetto is a summation of my personal and lifelong experiences and observations as a prisoner within the ghetto long before I was aware that I was really a prisoner. To my knowledge, and this is important for those of you who raise many questions, it's very important for you who are in social sciences, to my knowledge, there is at present nothing in the vast literature of social sciences and textbooks and nothing in the practical or field training of graduate students in social science to prepare them for the realities and the complexities of this type of involvement in a real dynamic, turbulent, and at times seemingly chaotic community. And what is more, nothing anywhere in the training of social scientists, teachers, or social workers now prepares them to understand or to cope with the changes that are going on. These are grave lacks which must be remedied. That's a terrible indictment again in our total educational system in terms of our, our colleges and our universities because I'm convinced now that one of the reasons that we do, that he can make such an in indictment and I have made the same is that you and I have not been taught to be human beings. We have every possible course in the university, but we are really taught how to be non-human beings. And one of the major hang-ups we have is being taught to become technicians, to develop a technician mentality. And I call that one of my first middle-class hang-ups. Leading the list of the middle-class hang-up is the technician mind. This is the belief that everything can be solved if we have the right people with the right skills. Technology has the answer to everything. People in time are not given space in the problem, and right skills mean the same thing as insight. And those of us who are of the minority races have found out that this is all a lie. Example, 1965, when I came to this city, I was attempting to find housing and could not find housing because of discrimination. Finally, was able to get an apartment, but it was only because the Department of Labor, federal government, had made it very clear to the management of this particular building that I would get an apartment, or that there would be some consequences. So I got the appointment with some persuasion. But I had had a white minister who went around with me for two days. He would go and he would be told that the, the, the building or the room or the apartment was available. And I would go and it was not available, or we would both go and they would say, well, uh, I must call the owner, I'm only the manager. <laughs> so finally, I got this apartment. And then a young man came to the city. The Urban League called me and said, Lillian, you were able to find a nice apartment and we would like for you to help this young man. Now this man had all of the credentials, this is my point, had all of the credentials, responsible citizen, had an education, his education went beyond even a PhD. He had a postdoctorate degree from Carnegie. And was, how many of you know what Corningware is? He helped to invent it. Black man. <laughs> Came to this city and I, said, all right, and I tried to help him find an apartment. He had two children. I ended up by saying to him, well, I'm living in the YWCA. My furniture isn't to come for another week. That's all right, I will cancel it. You take this apartment. It was two bedrooms and a bath and a half, and with two children, this would have been fun. Called up this agency, and the agency said, we're sorry, Miss Anthony. We were perfectly willing to let you have it, but we're very sorry we cannot let him have it. On the basis that he had two children, and I then interrupted him to say, but you did have children there. The lady who opened the door, we knocked on the wrong door, had a baby in her arms. And he said, oh, yes, but we can't do anything. We don't put people out when they <laughs> have babies. You know? and he, but he interrupted me too soon. What he didn't know was the lady also had a three-year-old child on a tricycle. The building was one year old. <laughs> this was very disappointing. And so what we're saying is color is important, and you must understand that. 
you must begin to appreciate it. Another thing, and since we are in a, um, a, a um, this is a church school, isn't it? <clears throat> Theologically, the middle class person <laughs> is conservative, and he believes that all social ills can be solved by the church through preaching and praying. And he uses theological jargon and that is well known and continues to use well-used platitudes. And I feel that the church has failed more than any other institution in this country next to the educational institution. Because the church has said that we, you know, profess and hold all these things to be true from a higher intelligence and a greater power. And we rely on this power to give us humanity and to give us the guts and the courage to do what we have to do. And I think we profane and blaspheme then than, than the than religion and Christianity. I say religion and Christianity, remembering that there are Jews and there are Mohammedans and there are others who do not believe in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. This I believe in. And I have seen miracles happen. I've seen them happen since I've been in this job. Mike Gaines, who is a Jewish man who is the deputy in our department, said to me the other day, you know, it's almost like it came out of uh, Acts. He said, almost you persuaded me. <laughs> so many good things have happened to us that were just unbelievable. With the city council and other things, it's just been unbelievable. And one of the good things is that since our department has been in business since December the 1st, we have some 50 cases of allegations of discrimination and segregation in this city. About half of them we have been able to conciliate. Example, I don't know how many of you saw the Saturday paper. On Friday, we had gone to review a film. And this film was a, an ad of, for an insurance company. The insurance company had an Indian shooting a bow and arrow with some fire on the end of it into a house. There was another one at the same time taking clothes from the line, stealing clothes from the line. And so an Indian had come to us and said that they found this very offensive. And why, so they don't want to use you people throwing Molotov bombs at houses and things. So why should they use us using bow and arrows? <laughs> That's showing, you know, arson and theft and there were some other things. We then kindly said to them, you know, we would like to have that film to show today at 3 o'clock to the Human Relations Commission. We wrote them a letter to this effect. On Saturday, I picked up the paper, and it said that this film has been taken, this advers advertisement for this insurance company had been taken off the air. Now, they hoped, you see, that this was going to keep us from showing it to the Human Relations Commission today. It didn't. <laughs> We're going to show it and then bring about establishing probable cause. Because unless we continue to let people know how offensive these things are to another human being, how this demeans and how this then takes away one's human dignity. You know, we're not getting anywhere. We have um, also, you might have read in the paper also uh, on Friday or Saturday that we have a case against the city attorney's office. This is a real bad one. It's bad because if we really get up against the wall, I'm supposed to be able to go to the city attorney's office for help. Uh, I, I, These are the kinds of complexities that we are beginning to deal with, but it's very exciting, and some of them are very sad. We have a young Indian man, a young boy, 14 years old, who was brought in by his mother, severely beaten, and he alleges that a policeman did this to him between elevators. We're trying to establish probable cause here, but this is very difficult because we cannot investigate, the only case that we cannot investigate is the police. And we're trying to do something today to begin to find a way to have the right to investigate allegations in terms of police brutality. At this point, whenever we get a complaint against the police department, we must give it to Chief Hawkinson. 
he investigates it. I would like to say that in terms of the civil disobedience, notice I did not say riot, that has occurred across the United States is a revolution. And I would appeal to you not to condone it, but to understand it. When Watts, when the riot or the civil disobedience occurred in Watts, I happened to be flying in that very evening. And these are one of the things, I don't call these miracles, I really give God a hard time about this. I don't know why he has, <laughs> why he puts me in all these peculiar situations which make people say, oh Lillian, you're exaggerating and you're lying. But I arrived in Watts the night it hit. I arrived in Harlem the day after. I was working in Wisconsin out of Chicago and arrived in Chicago when it hit. <laughs> that all begins to smack of something, doesn't it? <laughs> I didn't have anything to do with it. But I was sitting on this plane feeling much annoyed at having to sit next to this white man. And the reason I was feeling much annoyed was because I had been working with a group of Presbyterian white people, about 500 of them, for a week, and they had given me a nervous rash. And I got on that plane, and I thought, God, I just cannot go through this one more time. I know this man's going to start looking at me and smiling, and he's going to want to be cordial. He's going to want to be friendly. He's going to ask me, going to introduce himself. <laughs> he's going to ask me who I am. Then he's going to get into the whole pin about the problem. Now, I cannot take it. And so I was just kind of shriveling up over here in my little seat. <laughs> like, uh, just don't say anything to me. Well, luckily, it was one of the first times I'd been on the plane where they showed the movies. And they showed a movie that I hadn't seen. Started looking at that movie, and the next thing I knew, I'm a terrible person to go to the movies with. I was beating him. <laughs> I was having a good time in that movie, and he was laughing, and we were talking. <laughs> so in spite of myself, here I am, you know, getting all involved. And then the pilot said, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to say to you, if you would look on the left-hand side of the plane, you will see fires, and you will see smoke. They are not the usual kind of California forest fires. It's a riot. Well, have you ever been aware of something? For instance, they, we've been told that if we go to a theater and there is a, a, a fire, don't stampede, don't mob. You know, we've been taught that. But when it happens, that's what you do. When this man said riot, I just said, I thought, you know, riot. It didn't even, I didn't understand. I thought, riot? Didn't make sense. People fighting people or what? Then I heard a man, the whole plane began to buzz. It's one of these planes where everybody, there's no first and second class. I heard all this buzzing, buzzing. I heard somebody say, well, what do they want next? We've given them everything. I thought, oh, oh. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 they're talking about us. <laughs> I thought, well, well, well. <laughs> and I thought, riot. And I remembered that there had been a riot in Detroit, and some years ago there had been a riot in, in Chicago. And I thought, mm. So then they kept this up. And you know, the seats are so tall, you just can't turn around and see who's doing what. And so I just got up on my knees, and I said, fine. I said, we want everything that you have. And evidently, they intend to get it. And I sat down, and the plane went, <laughs> And believe it or not, as I grew up as a child and as a young adult, youth, I'm still young adult, I was shy, didn't talk, and here I had the nerve to get up and tell those people and didn't even know them, you know, what I thought. So when the plane landed, it was almost like a parting of the ways when I came in here, but just kind of letting me on through. And then I became alarmed because I hadn't seen my brother for some years, and I was anxious to see him. They had a new baby I had never seen, and they were not there. That was unusual for my brother. 
So I went to the phone and I called, just knowing that they were a part of this whole business. And my sister-in-law answered the telephone. She said, he's on the way back, but we were at the airport, and they announced that everybody should leave. And so we've come home, and he's on his way back to you. And I said, where's Daddy? And she said, Marshall is on his way after you. You'd better look for him. He's, right, he's probably there now, which meant then that my father was in the area where the ride was. So then my brother came, and he could not talk. And as we drove all the way to his house, tears were just rolling down his face. Finally, he said, with a horrible, broken voice, he said, this is going to set us back 50 years. Man, you'd have to know my brother. He's really a miniature Dick Gregory. He's a beautiful black man. And when he said it like that, you know, it's a lot of feeling and a lot of hurt. I hear my brother was the kind of an individual who had graduated from high school, a D-plus student. Never felt he could go to college, and I persuaded him to come to school with me. And he did on one condition, that I wouldn't tell anybody he was my brother. <laughs> As we found out throughout high school, the teachers were always saying to him, well, you certainly don't act like you are a sister or a brother to Lillian Anthony or Amanda Anthony. You don't you know, perform the same way. That hurt, but he came on that campus, and that's what he did. He graduated cum laude. He graduated Mr. Lincoln. He then went on and got his master's from UCLA. And so he's made it, and suddenly, he's the kind of man who lived, he and his wife, in an apartment for three years with only a bed, a bureau, a stove, a table, and two chairs. He said, I will not be in debt, the whole business of the stereotypes of the black man being in debt. I will not have a child until I can buy my own home. And so for eight years, they did not have a child. I will not buy a car until I can pay cash for it. And he wanted a Cadillac, and he bought it, and he paid cash for it. And so suddenly, all of this is going on around him, and he is sick at heart. He is saying, now, what is going to happen? Man, all the black people have to do is work and save and get educated. Mm. And so he sat up all night, and I was going to do some work in the Pacific Palisades again with white people. Now, I really am torn up about going to them in the midst of this ride. And then my brother took me the next day. We could not get to my father. We could not get to the telephones. They would not let us through the barricades. And so I went on to the Pacific Palisades, and my brother drove me in his brand new Cadillac car. We were stopped five times with policemen with helmets, and not only a gun, but the bayoneted gun. What are you doing in this area? And each time, I had to show them the correspondence of my invitation to teach at the Pacific Palisades. And finally, we got there, and my brother by now is really upset. And so he left me, and the next Sunday, I was looking for a church to go to. And I went to a church because the bulletin board said, Playboy Revisited. <laughs> I wanted to see what they're going to preach about in terms of the Playboy. But when the man got up, he looked out at the congregation, and I just looked at him, and, and he had the same, it seemed to me, look that my brother had, and he said, you are responsible for the civil disobedience. You are responsible for the riot. And he told them, one after the other, the things that they had done historically and the things that they had done in that city recently. And he says, and you in this congregation will not be off the hook. Either you as members of this congregation leave this place this day, going into Watts to take food, to help, to clean up, to administer to the needs of the people, or you need not come back to this church. This is what this church is all about. I couldn't believe it. That's what I mean by miracles. I needed something to give me hope again. And as we went out of the church, you, people were beginning to form car cavalcades, caravans, and people were coming with food. And so then I went back and I asked the group that I was working with if they would take up some money, and they took up immediately something like $150. Now, how am I going to get it into the area? So I called up my brother and I asked him he, if he would come and get it, and he said, you must be out of your mind. I'm not going any place to do anything about for those people. I said, Daddy's in there. He said, but Daddy isn't a part of that ride. 
It's a bunch of hoodlums and young punks that are creating all that trouble. So I said, you come get this money right now because this is to help black people and you're black and I hung up. This time my brother came in his old raggedy 1954 Volvo. <laughs> <laughs> took the money, didn't say anything to me, and just dashed on off. To make a long story short, my brother is deeply involved in the whole redevelopment of the Watts area as a result of going in there that day, going in there with anger, going in with fear, and going in with tears. He now is helping to redevelop the area. My father was safe. He said he just sat on his porch and watched them go in there and loot and carry on. And I said, Daddy, you didn't take any of that stuff, did you? And my daddy is not beyond that. <laughs> <clears throat> I think all of the things that have happened in terms of Watts, Chicago, Harlem, Chicago, and Minneapolis, Minnesota, Newark, New Jersey, it's important for you to understand it was never in a retaliation or a vindictive mood was the same kind of hate being turned in on oneself. And I say this from the historical perspective that the black people and the colored peoples of this world do not have the murderous criminal records of white people in this country. And that's why you will hear black people and other minority groups saying that the white society is sick. And that's why you hear black separatists saying that we want our children a part and out of that sick society. And that is why you hear the nationalists say the same thing. And that is why I will say to you that if this world and if this nation is to be saved, I'm totally convinced it will be saved by black people and colored people. And I say that because we have not taken on that mentality. We have not taken on the mentality that human life is not worth anything. We have not taken on the mentality that the almighty dollar means that anything is expedient and you can do anything with anybody. And I'm saying the whole business of property and ownership is basically the sickness that's in this country and we have not been able to get over it. Since the Portuguese in 1442 brought out the first slave from Africa into Portugal and on into Spain, we have had troubles. And since it was the papal bulls of the church which said it's fine for you to go in there and take other human beings and make them property, the church has been and has endorsed this activity. It was only some of the few abolitionists in, in our period, in our time, who began to say this is not right and I would then like to quickly turn you, and I, I, I'm not going to be able to use but a few because so many of you are standing up, you won't be able to see it anyway. But I will show you two pictures of two black scientists that I think are important. I had 14. <laughs> Let me just use one. You and your school and your, whether it's university training, college training, or elementary training, have not really been taught the history of people in this country who were different from yourselves. And very few of you, if I name these names, can tell me who they are. But I want to tell you when people have spoken of getting an education, becoming a responsible citizen, forgetting slavery, you can't do that because then you're denying the whole total historical perspective. This man's name is Louis Latimer. Let me just read what it says about Louis Latimer. Louis Latimer was an associate of Thomas Edison in experimental work in the field of electricity. To him goes the honor of having solved the problem of transforming the electric current into light through the invention of incandescent light. He superintended the installation of electric lights in New York City, Philadelphia, London, and many other large cities. He was also chief draftsman of the General Electric and Westinghouse companies. He also drafted plans for Alexander Graham Bell. He drafted the plans for the first telephone. I 
How many of you know who Charles Drew was? Oh, how many of you had a blood transfusion in here? Here's one, any others? Oh, you're a healthy group. <laughs> Charles Drew is the inventor of the conservative for blood plasma. And Charles Drew died in Atlanta. Let me put it on this side, maybe it'd be better. I just put him on the floor. Charles Drew had an accident in, in, um, not, uh, in Tuskegee, Alabama. Here it is. In 1950, and he had this accident, and as a result of it, he should have received medical help at, at a hospital, and they refused to give him medical help. The man who is responsible for setting up banks throughout the country, he set up the first blood bank. In 1942, it was called by the United States government to take charge of the blood con conservation by setting up these banks. As a result of his work, many millions of lives throughout the world have been saved. And here, this man, just because he was black, could not receive medical attention, and he died. And these are the kinds of terrible things that have happened. Did you know that it was a black man every time you've been on a train? How many of you have been on a train? You know, you've got to ask those kind of stupid questions these days. You've got airplanes, and you fly everywhere. How many of you have been on a train? Woo, very good. Very good. But every time that train knocked itself together, that was invented by a black man, beard, called the coupling device. He saw men jumping over things and losing arms and hands and feet. And he said, look, somebody ought to be able to do, design something to prevent that. And so he designed something that when the train hit, it locked, called the coupling device. How many of you know about the drip cup? Most of you young men should know about that. Elijah McCoy, have you heard somebody say it, that's the real McCoy? This man invented, uh, Elijah McCoy invented something called the drip cup. Every time you go 60 miles an hour and over, you're able to do that because of this lubricating device that Elijah McCoy, a black man, invented. And these are the kinds of things that have not been a part of the history. And had you been taught these things, you could not then think that a black man or anyone else was less than you. When we have used this in a class, black children just sit there and their eyes sparkle and they just stick out their chest and white kids look a little bewildered. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. <laughs> and I think we have something very precious and very fine, which I hope we don't lose. And which is called soul. You've heard a lot about soul. It's very hard for us to, to define. But it's the ability to feel. It's the ability to be emotional. And we've always taken this as a criticism. And young women, when young men say to you, you know, oh, she's emotional, then say, thank God I am. <laughs> that means that you still can feel things. And we're taught in this society not to really show feeling. I sat with three groups yesterday in training sessions. I sat with a group at Bethel Synagogue. I sat with a group at Munsingware. I sat with a group from General Mills. I'll use the last group, General Mills. I asked them when I came in, I said, I couldn't do it with you because you're too many. I said, you will know who I am. You know something about me. <laughs> Tell me who you are. Well, they went around, they told me there were 18, what their names were. Then I said, okay, tell me just a little bit about yourself. One man said, well, you tell us about yourself. Now, all these people are white, except one black brother. And I said, no, he's going to introduce me. Tell me about yourself. We sat there. They sipped on their cocktails. They ate their salad. One man began to talk about, um, well, I, um, I have, this is off the subject, but uh, would you tell me, is the Poor People's March a Poor People's March for black people or all people, or is it really a civil rights march? I 
looked at the man next to me and I said, I wonder how long it's going to take him to tell me who he is or something about himself. You know, we timed it for 30 minutes, 30 minutes. Not one human being around that table, except finally the black cat said to me, um, I don't think maybe you knew I, I went to Lincoln University, the same school you went to. I said, oh, so we talked about that a little bit. Finally, the man next to me on this side said, you know, I came from a farm background and I have a brother who has a turkey farm and he's very poor, so we know what poverty is. Another man, two men over from him said, well, he said, you know, I used to work for a black man, and we called him nigger man. And we all perked up. He said, I worked for him for $2 an hour every night. He bootlegged whiskey. And a hand was supposed to come in that had three fingers on it. And if any other hand reached in there, I was supposed to come down with a knife. He said, because those three fingers belonged to nigger man who was bootlegging at him. So somebody said to him, where was that? And he got very red. <laughs> and he said, come on, tell us, where was it? He wouldn't tell. Only three people around that table was willing to give me a little bit of themselves. And yet they wanted me to come in there and do all that I'm doing here with you. Hmm? Didn't want to give up anything. The night before, with the other group, I had asked them to tell me where they live. One man said, I live in Homewood. One said, Adina. One said, Golden Valley. I said, where do you live? Each question I asked three to four times. Finally, one man said, well, I really don't want to tell you where I live. Fine, brother. At least you're being honest. And what I'm saying is, you've got to learn to give. And you've got to learn to give up. And one of the things you've got to give up And it's going to be hard. You have got to learn to give up your decision making for another human being. You've got to permit the black man, the Indian, the Puerto Rican, and others, and Africans, to determine their destiny. You've got to permit us to make whatever mistakes we're going to have to make. You're going to have to go through this total catharsis with us of getting ourselves together. And secondly, you have got to, as white people, get yourselves together and research yourself and study yourself and understand that you are the problem. The problem is not the black man, the Indian, the Puerto Rican, and others. All of the oppressive things that are happening in this country were not done to other people by Indians, black people, etc. Etc. That's what my teacher said. It's by the white system. And don't get hung up on being an individual in this system. It's the white system, and every white man, woman, and child is a part of it. And so you need to study yourself and work on yourself without black people. And this is going to be hard. As long as we're there, then you cannot cast your own shadow. I have been working with 20 uh, white people to go out and do this very thing. And they're now coming back saying they don't want to go out anymore. Mr. Falk at the University of Minnesota said, Lillian, I have never felt the hostility and the anger as I have felt from groups as I, as I have been attempting to do this. They're using this instrument called Take a Look in the Mirror and others. Another one called from the Presbyterian Church and said, you know, I've never been so ill and so sick as I was when I left that group up at Clear, Clear, Clear Water. He said the people were just sick. I've never felt such hatred in my life. What they said to them was, how can you talk to us this way? You are white like the rest of us. And I'm saying, if you begin to take a stand and you begin to point out that this is a racist society, and if you say, I am a white racist, then you're in trouble. Then you just are going to begin to feel what black people and minorities have felt in this country ever since we put our foot on that first game plank unwillingly. It's another thing people don't understand. <laughs> that we rather, some of us rather but rather than to be going to slavery, threw ourselves overboard and killed ourselves. 
And there was one black strong man who was able to get just a hammer off of a ship. And he made them turn that ship around and take them back. And many of you don't know the strength and the beauty that came out of Africa. You've never been taught about the great empires of Sangha, which is Ghana. You haven't taught about the great empires of Ethiopia, which was then called Abyssinia. You haven't been taught that the greatest library in the world was out of Timbuktu. You haven't taught, been taught that there were great medical men who left Africa to go and to take care of people in Europe. You haven't been taught that we were a part of the beginning of the invention of glass and in Egypt, paper, the Shadus, the first machine in the world. We've been only taught about the dark continent. And so I'm saying, learn about white racism, white racism in the United States. I would recommend one book in particular, A Sign for Cain by Dr. Wortham, a white psychiatrist who talks about how white people act out their violence on other people. I would like to close quickly with a piece called A Parable from Another Country. A monkey heard this while going to visit Python one Christmas day, and when he arrived, Python called aloud to his mother like this, Mama, Mama, bring us some food. My friend the monkey has arrived. And monkey was tired and he was hungry, and he thought, I am so lucky. I will eat myself to death. And so he rushed to the floor where the well-cooked meal was placed, and monkey said, Python, monkey said, Python, go wash your hands. Nobody eats with dirty hands. And so he went and washed his hands, and he hurried to where the food was. Do you call those hands washed was what Python said? Have some sense. Use soap and warm water. Monkey went and did so, and he returned with clean hands and palms out. Now, monkey, where were you raised? How can you come to the table so dirty and so smelly and so black? Get that blackness off of your hands. So monkey took a butcher knife, and he skinned away the black skin on his palms. The palms turned red, red with blood, and tears dropped from his eyes as the blood dropped from his hands. He was still hungry. He had come to eat. How can you be so uncultured, so unintelligent? Don't touch my food with your blood. I'm no cannibal. Those were Python's words. And Monkey started for home. And he heard a dove singing, accept him as he is, accept him as he is. Another Christmas day came, and Python was going to visit Monkey. And he too heard the dove singing, accept him as he is, accept him as he is. Countryman, said Monkey to Python, you are most welcome. And Python spread his 20-foot length on the floor, filling almost every space. Mama Monkey, her son called, bring us the feast. And food was brought and placed on the floor. And Monkey sat on his hunches and he laid his hands on his knees. Now, Python, my countryman, get seated. And Python called himself into a heap like tires of different sizes. Mr. We don't call that sitting, said Monkey. Now get seated like other folks, see what I mean? And so Python uncalled himself, and he pushed the greater part of his 20 feet outside the hut. His head was near the pot of food. I didn't tell you to lie on your belly. You must sit and to sit properly inside the house, said Monkey like that. So Python assembled all of himself inside the hut. He started to sit on his tail, and his head went up, 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 till he pierced through the roof, and Monkey ate the food. He took a cut lash, and he chopped off Python's tail. And Python hurried with a bulk of his length through the roof, and they both heard the dove singing. Accept him as he is, ex accept him as he is. The dove will sing. Accept him as he is, as he is. Many of us have become like the monkey and the python, and few of us sing like the dove. Accept him as he is. Thank you very much.